Welcome, friends. My name's Kevin McGuire, and we are live from Gatlinburg. I've lived um, most of the work during that time frame at the Red Cross shelter, which, you know, since I'm retired and uh, out on disability or veterans with disability, I had a free time where I could go there almost as a full time job. Okay. Um, as I came out of the American Legion meeting, I uh, heard on the radio about the, you know, the beginnings of what all was going on in Gatlinburg, about the reports of the fire in Gatlinburg, not realizing the extent of it. Later, I even uh, start, you know, all of us. I think like most of the surrounding counties around that area, so everybody calling them, people we knew in the area, checking on folks. Also, I, I had a friend of mine who's a vet that's up there who I knew had some difficult times. And so whenever we couldn't get a hold of her, it was, you know, usually one thing is a little, you know, you get worried about her. But when it got to the point where we couldn't get any information, you know, so I decided to just go. So went up to Wears Valley, and then that's the point when we ended up in the fires. And, you know, the fire trucks were going around us to... Uh, combat the fires, and that was off of uh, Where's Valley Road down there, was it Family Dollar or something like that down that way? And so that was the first, uh, you know, I guess emergence in the fires because came around on a curve. Oh, you drove up one curve, saw a fire truck in the parking lot of a church, uh, fueling up the uh, its water tank at the fire hydrant, and then uh, we passed them, um, saw all the smoke, and went around the uh, curve. And I remember turning all the air conditioning and everything off. In the car because it was getting, you know, smoky there, and uh, moving around the curve, and then there's flames and all that sort of stuff. And uh, that was the the morning of the, the the next morning. You know, I've been up to that area since, and of course, I think probably eighty five nine percent of the homes in that area, are, you know, just like many of them now, just the foundations, and sometimes not even that. I'm, I'm a Red Cross volunteer also, I was, uh, you know, signed on and said I was available to help. And then uh, we set up the uh, rescue shelter at the uh, community center in Peter Forge. So um, that was interesting seeing that perspective because they gave us the two big gyms. Yeah, exactly. and went through and set up rows and rows of uh, cots and got pillows and you know, all those things like that. And uh, all the necessities that we could, uh, you know, just put out there for them. I've got pictures of the... Uh, Shelter before anybody came in there, and um, you know it was I don't know how many beds we've been there, well over a hundred maybe two. Uh, went to um, Food City there in Kodak to grab water because you know everybody had that rush on water trying to get sure. for the uh, workers, the firefighters and such. And it was interesting that see the uh, empty shelves of water at Kodak, you know. And initially, I understand that initially it was people buying as much as they could, and the uh, I believe the management. Uh, cease that uh, from everybody and donate the rest of it. So instead of, you know, everybody having to just worry about trying to come in and get water and just Here say, the heck with this, this is all yours. Yeah. And so a lot of people at that point would get out and Gatorade packets and you know, anything like that. But anyway, that was just a week caveat on Jump Back Home. And so uh, at the shelter, um, it was interesting to start to see, uh, you know, our intake of uh, people. And uh, interesting, like, and some people that I hadn't seen since my days in working hard rock in the 90s. Yeah, right. Yeah, so oh, that was wow. kind of neat. Uh, awkward uh, reunion, I guess. Uh, of course, you know, we have so many people from Ohio and uh, uh, Michigan that's, you know, not that familiar with the mountains when they first get here. So we had, uh, I remember one fellow I spoke with, uh, he worked at Bubba Gumps and lived up on Ski Mountain. Oh. Had just moved here a handful of weeks before. So him and his wife coming down the mountain a fire, you know, I'm sure we're still trying to get used to the area. I can't imagine the fear that they would have uh, experienced. And uh, you know, coming down Ski Mountain is bad enough at 10 miles an hour. Of course, okay. people that were very concerned about their pets and such, so, uh, try, so trying to coordinate a little bit with the uh, uh, main shelter that was out at the fairgrounds or whatever organization was running that one. Mm -hmm. And um, just at that point, you know, that's a whole other story in itself that I'll, I fortunately didn't. Uh, worked too much with that because you know seeing all those pets that the, I did go up there uh, a couple times to bring some stuff with uh, some friends and blankets and yeah it was interesting just seeing fear in animals like that and confusion mm -hmm. you know, especially a pet that's usually so uh, you know playful and such and then 
having so much confusion. It's, uh, you know, they're all living beings, and uh, still, you know, the, even though they're pets, they still suffer, right. and their comprehension of everything, you know, it's like, the how does an animal realize what happened? But yeah, so it was interesting working with the people at the shelter, trying to see if we could find out anything about their animals. But you know, it was very difficult to figure out, um, you know, from a description of an animal to, you know. So that was the interesting liaisoning, which fortunately, eventually, they just went straight to them. And, uh, you know, later on, uh, working with some of the ashes sifting, you know, it was not uncommon to come through uh, uh, remains of an animal. Yeah, so which was kind of uh, weird to, you know, see that and just wonder about that person's uh, attachment to animal and the impact. But um, yeah, so we did have a actual uh, area of the uh, shelter that was uh, sanctioned off for pet owners that brought their hmm. pets. All right. Some of them, you know, the, they made sure it was pets with them for anything else. And, you know, it's uh, it may be a pet to some people, but it's a loved one to those groups, those people. How long after, I think it was about the uh, third week, second or third week of December, Team Rubicon came in, which is another organization I've been with for a while. And so I put my name with them because, you know, there's, they're a bunch of vets, so sure. we all speak the same language, me being a vet too. So I um, put my name with them and then I ran into a couple of them uh, that I didn't know until I ran into them. I just saw their shirts and they were at the concert downtown and I chat with them and then finally got my... Uh, or, you know, information or more orders to, to help them out. So them jumped over from Red Cross to uh, Team Rubicon. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, uh, was finally getting into the uh, debris removals and sifting and all that sort of stuff. But uh, mm -hmm. driving through that morning was kind of weird because the smell of it, um, you know, all the residual, uh, the smoky smell, which was uh, reminiscent of other places I've been with specifically uh, like Baghdad, I mean, you know, a place in the war. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of weird for that. And that's, I've talked to some other veterans that that was an issue for them because they're trying to help, but yet uh, combat other things, you know, in their heads because the smells would remind them. Wow. Of some of the debris, and especially when you got up in some place where you just saw like a, uh, was it the, the loops? Mm -hmm. uh, not far from, you know, one ridge over. Loop road. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's so many homes got damaged, you know, I was just saying that as a, uh, that was reminiscent for a lot of folks. Yes. For some people, it's not even going to want to go back near a campfire anytime soon or a fireplace. PTSD, you know, I've thought about, you know, some of my veteran friends I've talked about that, you know, PTSD is not just a military thing, you know, it's also civilians and stuff like this, you know, for anybody that's, you know, this is going to be, some people are just driving through the roads, especially going up Ski Mountain or something like that, that had to come down those roads. That's going to be a very difficult thing for them to do. But, you know, you have sights and sounds, but it seems like the smell is what kind of impacts the most. Or even if you get that taste in the air again. George Jenkins, also known as Sparky. Uh, we were having a party at my house up on Ski Mountain Road, almost up to Ober Gatlin Road. Uh, my son and his wife was there. It's a belated birthday party. My wife and I were there. Uh, two dogs were in the house. Uh, that there was a heavy smoke that was in the area from chimney tops. So when they, she came in for my birthday, they came up for my birthday, and we're having a birthday party. His wife decided to leave because she wasn't feeling well. That's correct. I right. heard nothing from the officials. Nothing's going on on my road. Uh, so he called fire department, or not fire, police department, and he said, we're okay. If you're on Ski Mountain Road, you're safe. We're what not time evacuating. Was that was somewhere around 7.30-ish. And so I was going to stay and watch a movie with my son, and he said, Dad, she wants me home. So I guess she's kind of freaking out or something there, too. And we did not realize the pick that she was in. Uh, so within 15 minutes, we're going headed down the road. Inside of a mile uh, is where I see the first flames. I want to describe this. I've got a telephone pole. Right next to the telephone pole is what was cut off a telephone pole. Uh, and it seemed like, if you can imagine a large gas pipe with flames coming out of it, that's what I saw. Okay, and it just kept getting worse and worse. Okay, until I got down to one point where there's two cars behind me, one car in front of me. Uh, there's, <laughs> uh, he stops because he can't see, and we'd actually gone through, it seemed like hell, 
you know, because flames are going up on either side of us. We, as far as we can see, flames. Uh, so I waited till he got backed up around me with my wife in the back seat. I could tell she's in the process of verge an asthma attack. My son's trying to tell me to punch it and get us out of here. It's like, hey, wait till the guy's not in front of me, then I can do something. So I work my way around her or him and then get down a little bit. And uh, I'm pretty sure this is where a motel that was condemned and closed was. It got burned down because I saw it after the fact. And if you can imagine roasting a turkey and opening that oven door, you know, with the door and windows, bolt, everything shut, that's what it felt like. It felt like that hot air coming inside the car through the door. Uh, so as we worked our way on past there, and got downtown, it was better, but still, turn left on River Road, look up to your left, the entire, as far as you can see, the entire mountain's all the way in flames. The worst spot I remember is the chairlift, because uh, you, you could see the flames more visibly right there. <laughs> we knew it was bad. So. Uh, and I, I just have never seen anything like that. I really thought we were gonna die. I mm -hmm. thought we were gonna die from smoke inhalation, mm -hmm. and they find our bodies the next day. That's how bad it was, and the smoke was so thick you couldn't see through it. So it was. And well, that's going to be rough on you, having had a bout with asthma, life-threatening asthma, sitting in the back seat with all that smoke around you. Yeah. What was that like? I couldn't breathe. Mm -hmm. I couldn't breathe. I just mm -hmm. kept saying, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. You know, when George came up with it down, you can't roll the window down. I can't breathe now. So it was pretty frightening. I didn't think we were going to live. I didn't think we were going to make it through it. I really didn't. And I still... When we come back down here, have fears, um, not uh, sort of reliving it, you mm -hmm. know, just going, gosh, you know, this was so scary and so frightening. Mm -hmm. one, one of the places I used to clean, there's a hot tub, okay, on the deck about right there. Mm -hmm. So I'm down here and I see where the deck's all burned away and everything's falling, mm -hmm. okay. It doesn't, it doesn't bother me that the, the, the cover's gone, that the sides of it's gone, but there's a motor pump about this big made out of steel. Mm. Okay, it wasn't there. How about this one? Now, we kind of understand what happened here, uh -huh. but if you can imagine, after the fact, seeing the tire marks from the melting tires, mm -hmm. okay, and seeing the footprints mm -hmm. from the melting tennis shoes, Okay, mm -hmm. and then at one point they came, the tire marks were close to the footprints, mm -hmm. and then the footprints just stopped. It's like, yeah, okay, we don't believe that he evaporated, probably got inside that truck and just jumped up in and mm -hmm. left. But still, when you see something like that, it's kind of freaky. <laughs> wow, yeah. So you haven't heard any of those stories? No. Okay. And everybody has a different, it's like blind men touching an elephant, you're going to get uh, a different story from everyone who is at a different place. place. Yeah. When the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, it's a more bells will ring, ting a ling a ling, then you sing Vita Bella.